You know, when it comes to prayer, I think kids have got it figured out, folks. Prayer is just simply sharing with God what's on your heart and what's in your mind, no matter how simple, no matter how silly, no matter how silly it may be. For those of you visiting with us today, we're actually in the midst of a series of sermons that we had mentioned earlier that is entitled, Like Jesus. Over the next couple of weeks, E.L. and I are attempting to challenge you to simply become more like Jesus. And again, I realize when I say that, there might be some of you thinking, well, is that even possible? And once again, I say, I think so. And the reason I say that is because there is a passage of Scripture found in the book of 1 John, chapter 2, verse 6, that simply reads, whoever claims to live in Christ must walk as Jesus did. And as I said last week or a couple of weeks ago, that should be the goal of every one of us in this room, to be more like Jesus in the way that we talk, in the way that we think, uh, in the way that we act. And of course, the best way to become more like Jesus is to simply look to Jesus. And that's what we're attempting to do over these next couple of weeks. After all, he is our perfect example, is he not, folks? And he's commanded us to follow in his steps. Now, as I reflected on all that Jesus did while he was on earth, I thought one of the best places that we could start was with prayer. Jesus, I believe, exemplified a consistent and fervent prayer life. And I think that there are many things that we can learn from Jesus about how to pray. And so this morning, I want us to look together at what I think is the master teacher and learn how to pray like Jesus. Jesus. And the best place to start is in Matthew chapter chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles with you this morning or your smartphone has a Bible app, why not get it out and open chapter, chapter six, 6 this morning. morning. Now, now in Matthew, Matthew chapter, chapter six, 6, picking up in verse 9, Jesus said, said and by the way, I don't know if you're aware or not, but Luke's gospel, gospel in Luke chapter 11, 11 it, it says that this is teaching on prayer, prayer that, that we're about, about to look at in Matthew's gospel. gospel that this, this teaching, teaching on prayer was actually in response to Jesus' disciples' request that he teach them to pray. Like John the baptizer was teaching his followers or his disciples to pray. And so here in Matthew chapter 6, picking up in verse 9, Jesus gives for us what many would say is the model for an effective prayer. In fact, in some of your verses of the Bible, they identify this section as it. We refer to it as the Lord's Prayer, but there are some verses that actually acknowledge it as the model prayer. Because Jesus was modeling for his disciples when, when to their request of asking him, how should we pray? And so here in Matthew chapter 6, let's pick up in verse 9, and I think we'll find some clues that are, are in some way help us to pray more effectively as Jesus taught us to pray. I want you to notice, first of all, that effective prayer begins with worship. And the reason I say that is because in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, Jesus begins by responding to his disciples' request by saying this, this is how you should pray. This is the model that I'm setting for you. Start like this, he said, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You see, what I think Jesus was trying to get across to us both was that our prayers are not so much what we want from God. That's not how we begin our prayers. Jesus is teaching that our prayers ought to begin by acknowledging God for who he is and for what he's done. How be your name, he said. Then, and many of us are raised in a selfish society where we look out for number one, but quite the contrary, here we're taught from the very beginning of our prayer that we should acknowledge that Jesus' will be done on this earth, and that means in our lives as well. Then and only then comes the next step, which I'm going to refer to as that of petition, our asking of God. By the way, did you notice that the asking of God came later in the prayer? So often in our prayer life, the first thing we want to do is begin to, God, this is what I need. This is what I want. And the Bible says just the contrary. We begin by acknowledging God for who he is. We begin by asking God that his will be done in our lives. But then we present those requests to God. Jesus taught us in verse 11 to pray this way. Give us this day our daily bread. You see, folks, this is the part of prayer where we begin to share our needs with God. Because by doing so, listen to me when I say this, by doing so, we are acknowledging that God is the source of our provision. Do you understand that? You're not a self-made man or person. 
You're acknowledging that all that you have comes from God. And so we request this of God, and in doing so, we show our dependence upon him. Now, the fourth element of effective prayer, at least according to Jesus, Matthew chapter 6 here, is in verse 12 where Jesus prayed, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now, I realize some of your versions might have forgive us of our trespasses. Maybe that's the way you learned it when you were growing up. Forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. But let me just be honest with you this morning. The word trespass is not the word that Jesus used here. The Greek word that Jesus used here is the word ophelia, which means debt, D-E-B-T, debt. You see, because of your sin, you are indebted to God. Anybody here know what it is to be in debt? You get that monthly letter from b you are indebted to them. And what that, Jesus is teaching us here very plainly is that because of our sin, we owe God something. By the way, that's a debt we could not pay, folks. Only Jesus Christ could and did pay that price at Calvary's cross. So when we pray, hear me when I say this, when we pray, forgive us our debts, God is expecting us to repent of those sins, that indebtedness to him, that's what our sin is, it indebts us to him so that we might receive his forgiveness. And so when we pray, forgive us of our sins, we're acknowledging that we are living a life that goes contrary to how God wants us to live. And then when we pray as we forgive our debtors, God is expecting us, let me say that again, God is expecting us to extend that same forgiveness to those who are indebted to us. Those who, because of their sin, become indebted to us. In other words, and here's what I'm trying to say, we forgive because we ourselves have been forgiven. So be careful when you pray, forgive us of our debts as we forgive those who are indebted to us. Because some of you need to hear that today. That we need to forgive. Why? Because we've been forgiven. But we'll talk about that later in this series, okay? Let's just move on. There's then trust, I think. In verse 13, Jesus asked us to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Folks, God is the only one who can protect us from evil. And so we are to pray without ceasing, according to the Apostle Paul. Is that not what he says? Pray without ceasing. And so we are to pray. We are to put our complete trust in God to help us to resist the devil's temptations. You remember a couple of weeks ago when we began this series, I said something like troubles are situations that are designed by God to draw us closer to him. So we also talked about temptations, and I said then that temptations are situations that were designed by Satan to draw you away from God. That's why Satan tempts us, to draw us away from God. And remember what James said in James chapter 1, verse 13? He says, God cannot be tempted, nor does God tempt us. So whenever you're tempted, I want you to understand that's not coming from God. It's coming from Satan himself. But the wonderful thing is that God says, I can even take those temptations that you face and use them for the good in your life. Because, as I said a couple of weeks ago, when you're tempted, folks, you can use it for good. Remember what we said? We said that temptation is actually an opportunity. It's an opportunity to do the right thing and not an opportunity to do the wrong thing. Every time you face temptations, you're facing an opportunity to become more like Jesus. And so our prayer should be That God doesn't allow Satan to tempt us or draw us away from him, but rather to deliver us from him. Now, it's funny, as Jesus began to close out this model prayer, he reverts back to the very first element. It's almost like a full circle. He gets back to that in worship. Because some of your Bibles here, or some versions of the Bible, which are later manuscripts, actually have Jesus closing this model prayer by saying, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. And so what we do is we close our prayers as we began our prayers by once again acknowledging the kingdom, the power, and the glory of God. Now that's a great model prayer 
to use when we pray to God. That's what Jesus said in response to his disciples. Lord, teach us to pray. Okay, this is how you should pray. But you know, in my study of Jesus' prayer life, I discovered something even more interesting. He taught us best by the prayers that he prayed. And so in the moments that I have left, here's what I want to do. I want us to look just real quickly at some of Jesus' prayers today and see if we can't learn to pray like Jesus. The first prayer that I want to refer to, and it's going to be up on the screen there with me if you don't mind, is actually found in John chapter 11. And in John chapter 11, we'll see that Jesus prays publicly. This is Jesus' public prayer, and he prays with a compassionate heart. In John chapter 11, if you're not familiar with this passage of Scripture, Jesus has arrived in this little town called Bethany to comfort some of his friends, his close friends, a woman by the name of Mary, a woman by the name of Martha. And the reason that he was comforting them was because their brother Lazarus, Lazarus has just died. And so Jesus has come to them, and now he's standing outside of Lazarus' tomb, and he lifts up his head, and he prays out loud, and this is what he prays according to John chapter 11, verses 41 and 42. Jesus says, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of those who are standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. Now, did you notice how Jesus began his prayer? The first thing he said was, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. Jesus always seemed to begin his prayers with thanks to God. But Jesus was always grateful, folks. Do you remember when Jesus fed the 5,000? Remember that story with the five loaves and the two fish? Every gospel writer tells us that prior to that that miracle, Jesus gave thanks. And then it seems that the the little boy's lunch was miraculously multiplied. At the end of his ministry, if you'll recall, just prior to his crucifixion, Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples, and he was instituting what we just took part in a few moments ago, that communion service. According to Matthew chapter 16, verses 26 and 27, the Bible says that Jesus took the bread... He gave thanks, and he broke it and gave it to his disciples. And the Bible says then that Jesus then took the cup, and he also gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. You see, what I'm trying to say is by his examples, Jesus taught us that we need to be thankful in our prayers. And folks, let's be honest. We have so much to be thankful for, do we not? You know, last week I prayed at the offering prayer, and my very first phrase in the offering prayer was, God, we are a blessed people. I think sometimes we forget that. I think sometimes we forget how good we really have. Now, I'm not saying life is perfect for you. In fact, the Bible says that we expect troubles in this life because we live in a sinful world. But I am saying that I guarantee you the good in your life far outweighs the bad in your life, and for that alone you can be grateful. And I would say for many of us in this room, the good in our life far outweighs the bad in our life. And for that, we've got to be grateful. We're blessed materially. I look around the room, and some of you, you look very nice today. I'm not saying that all of you don't, but you all, I should have said that. You all look nice today. I mean, let's be honest. We've been blessed, folks. I heard one time years ago, and I hope I get this statistic right, but they said that if you live in the United States and you live below the welfare poverty limit, which was like $15,000, if you live at or about the poverty level, you are richer than 90% of the people in the world. I hope I can verify that, but that's what I've heard all my life. Now, unless you've lived, into a, lived in a third world country or unless you grew up in the backwoods of West Virginia back in the 1930s, you really don't know what it's like, folks, to do without it. Because every time you open up that refrigerator, there's something in there. It may not be what you want, but there's something in there. And when you go out to that pantry or that closet there where you keep all your canned goods, there's something in there. It may be a can of beets. You have so much to be grateful for physically. Think about spiritually, folks. We live in America where we're at least allowed to practice the freedom of our religion. You understand that, right? You're here today of your own free will. There are some places in this world, folks, that are meeting in churches in secret for fear of their life. 
There's an organization called The Voice of the Martyrs. If you want to Google that sometime, just get on there and look for yourself and see about all the oppression that's going on in other countries when it comes to Christianity. You can't help but sit there and say, oh, I'm so blessed. I think about this church here, Compass Christian Church, how blessed we are. I was at a men's day yesterday, and I was sitting by a gentleman who just couldn't say enough about the good that this church is doing. And I said, I, I'm just, I stand back in awe of what God has done over these last six and seven months. E.O. was talking about this vision night that's coming up in a couple of weeks. And folks, we want to share with you what we think God's vision is for this congregation because it's happening so quickly. Who would have thought only six months ago a church of about a less than 100 and a church of about 150, 160, 170 would come together and within six months be running over 400 people? We stand in awe at what's happened. We talk in our staff meeting at nearly every Monday what a great day yesterday was. I can't tell you how many times we've said, what are your prayer requests? And we always try to finish up, okay, what was the highlight of the weekend? And it was always a spiritual blessing. It wasn't that we're just so glad we had 400 people. I I've never heard that expressed. What I've heard was, I met somebody yesterday who said this is the first time they've been to this church and they loved it. Or we met somebody who said, you know, I need to get right in my life and this church, I think, is going to provide me that opportunity. Or somebody will talk about there was places for my kids. It was great. There was somebody to greet me there. There was a security guy who made sure that my children were... You just hear people, and I can't help but sit there on Mondays and think, what a blessed congregation we have gelled together. I know... But let's, was a, I know Mechanicsville used to be a small town, and a lot of you grew up and you knew each other even before you got here. But let's be honest, Mechanicsville has exploded as well, and so there's a lot of new people. And they come in here, and the wonderful thing is, at least what I'm hearing from you, is that, boy, these folks are just reaching out to me, and it's like I've been here all my life. Now, I say that with a little hesitance, because I'm afraid some of you may come in here and say, you know, nobody's talked to me, nobody said anything yet. You know what my challenge always is? Listen, if you didn't feel like you were welcome today, come back next week, but sit somewhere else next week, okay? <laughs> it just might be that little section that's being a little mean. Now, I don't know who you are, but I'm just challenging you. Here's your opportunity to be a little bit nicer to those around you. That's what it is. Don't blame the whole church for what just a little section of people are doing, folks. And if worse comes to worse, you come up and sit on the front row with me here. I'll make sure you have a great time, okay? I promise you that, so... Let's move on, though. A second thing we learn from Jesus about his prayer at Bethany is that Jesus acknowledged that it was God who was doing the providing. Jesus said, Father, I know that you always hear me, but I say this for the benefit of those standing here, that you might, they might believe that you sent me. Listen to what I'm trying to say. Jesus prayed deliberately out loud so that Mary and Martha and his disciples would see this miracle and understand and give credit to God for what was about to happen. And I think in our prayers, whether they're private prayers, whether they're public prayers, I believe it's important that we always take time to recall the ways that God has provided for our needs. To say simply, God, I am a blessed person. And I acknowledge that all that I have comes from you. Let me move on. The second prayer that I want you to look at real quickly is actually found in Matthew chapter 26. Again, the words will be on the screen there, uh, on the side of me there. But here we see Jesus praying privately. And he prays with what I think is a submissive heart. This is just before he's arrested. And according to Matthew chapter 26, picking up in verse 39 and following, we read this. It says, going on a little farther, Jesus fell with his face to the ground, and this is what he prayed. He prayed, my father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then the Bible says that he went away a second time and prayed, my father, if it's possible for this cup to be taken away, and if it's not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. And then that next verse says, when he came back, he again found his disciples sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and he went away once more and he prayed a third time saying the same thing. Real quickly, did you notice first of all that Jesus, spent, Jesus left his disciples to spend time alone with God in prayer? You know, Jesus frequently did that. He withdrew from the crowd so that he could spend time with God in prayer. In fact, the Bible said sometimes he would pray all night, all night long. And I think we ought to make a concerted effort, folks, to spend time alone with God. 
praying to him in private. It's one thing to come to church and when you're asked to pray, to be willing to speak up in prayer. It's another thing to go home and have prayer for lunch or for your meal, say grace or whatever it is. But I think it's really effective, folks, when you get off by yourself and spend a little time alone with God. I want you to notice also in some of the most antagonizing moments or agonizing moments of his life, Jesus submitted himself to the will of God. He said in Matthew chapter 26, knowing that the cross was ahead of him, my father, if it's possible, may this cup, cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, as you will. Jesus demonstrates submission for us. And folks, our prayer ought to include, God, may your will be done in my life. Lastly, and I want to make sure I strike this right balance, Jesus repeated the same prayer three times went away once more and prayed a third time saying the same thing you might recall jesus told a parable one time about a persistent widow remember that story the widow who kept coming to the judge knocking at the door knocking at the door knocking at the door and she just kept knocking and knocking and knocking till he finally said what is it you want woman i'm kind of paraphrasing that <laughs> what jesus was trying to teach us was not to give up when it comes to those things that we fervently need or want in our lives Folks, we learn from Jesus' example to pray and not to give up. One last time I want us to look at Jesus' prayer, and that's found in John chapters 13 through 17. It's a whole section there. And in here we see Jesus praying personally. And I love this. This is what I want the church to see. He prays with a purposeful heart. If you remember, Jesus spent the last few hours of his life with his disciples. He was making sure that they would remember not only his teachings, but his mission as well. Those are the words that we find in John chapter 13, 14, and 15. And even in chapter 16, you're welcome to read that at your own leisure. But then at the climax of his teaching, Jesus lifted up his eyes to heaven. And this is what he prays aloud in front of his disciples. According to John chapter 11, at the beginning of the prayer, Jesus prays, first of all, for our salvation. Look on the screen here if you don't mind. Jesus prayed this. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and he prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. And then it says, for you have granted him authority over the people that he might give eternal life to all those that you have given to him. And then Jesus says, this is eternal life, that they may know you. God, this is what I want, for people to know you, the one and only true God. For people to know me, Jesus Christ, the one whom you've sent. Folks, it was Jesus' desire that we would come to know him as Lord and Savior, that we would receive his free gift of eternal life. That's what Jesus wants for you. Not only did Jesus pray for your salvation, he prayed for your protection as well. The world. And my prayer, listen to this, my prayer, Jesus says, is not that you take them out of the world, but rather that you protect them from the evil one. You see, folks, Jesus knew that we would experience trouble in this life. And so he prayed that we would find protection from our enemies through the power of God's word and through his Holy Spirit. And you forget that's what Jesus left you. That's why Jesus said, I must go so that he can come, the Holy Spirit, and comfort you in those times when you, when you need it. Lastly, Jesus prays for your witness. Look again at these verses of John chapter 20 verses, or John chapter 17 verses 20 and 21. Jesus prayed, my prayer is not for them alone. I also pray for those who will believe in me through their message. That's us, folks. 2,000 years before Jesus even ascended into heaven, 2,000 years before Jesus even went to the cross, he said, I'm praying for those who will hear about me through the message of the apostles. That we may be one, he says. Father, just as you and I are one. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. At the end of his prayer, Jesus was praying for us. Because the Bible says Jesus came to seek and save those who were lost. And the Bible says that Jesus then placed that responsibility of passing on that message to others, to those who would follow after him. He prayed that we would be united in him so that the world might see him living in us and as a result, the world might come to know him as well. Do you realize that's your responsibility? To live as Jesus lived so that others might take notice and follow after him. You've been saved so that you might live an example for others to follow, that they might come to know Jesus as well. Folks, think about it. 
Jesus spent 33 years living on this earth. He spent the last three years of those lives of those years ministering to the lives of people. He spent the last three days dying and raising from the dead. And what do you think he's praying for? Well, look at this. According to Romans chapter 8, verse 34, Paul says that Jesus Christ who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of the Father, the right hand of God, interceding for us. You understand what it says? The Living Bible says he is pleading on behalf of us. I don't know about you, but that blows my mind to think God and Jesus are having this conversation about me. In fact, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, again, another passage says, Jesus is able to completely save all who come to God through him since he will live forever. Listen to this. Since he will live forever, he will also be there to remind God that he, Jesus, has paid for our sins with his blood. I don't know if you realize it or not, folks, but that's amazing. That ought to blow your mind. Jesus is now sitting at the right hand of God, interceding for you, mentioning you by name to the Father. And the wonderful thing is that Jesus sees our sin. He understands our weaknesses. And so like he did at Golgotha, he is saying to God, to the Father, Father, forgive him. Forgive Mike. Don't hold this sin against him. And I don't know about you, but I would rather have Jesus interceding on my behalf than anybody that I could ask you to be put on your prayer list. And yet the Bible says that's exactly what Jesus is doing. It's comforting to know that Jesus, the one is speaking to the one who always listens, the one who always listens to our prayers, is praying for us. It's funny, and E.L., you probably have the same thing. As preachers, we, we often encounter people all the time who ask us to pray for them. And... and I remember somebody said years ago, and I think they said it rather jokingly, he said, well, don't you have some hot line to God? I mean, you're a preacher after all. Can't you just say, God, and, and this happens? Well, I don't have a hot line to God, but I do consider it a privilege when you ask me to pray. It's even more wonderful to know that Jesus is interceding on your behalf to God the Father. You don't deserve that, folks. But how exciting is it to know that not only does he know your name, but he's talking to the Father about you. That's why we pray in the name of Jesus, folks, because through him and only through him has God promised to listen to our prayers. The wonderful thing is Jesus is speaking to God the Father right now about us. He's speaking by name, our name. Father, I know this child of yours is messed up, but in his heart he wants to be just like me. Isn't it wonderful to know that Jesus is saying that about you? Father, I know this is a child of yours, and I know she's greatly disappointed you by her sin, but you know her heart. You know she wants to follow you. And to those of you who are yet to become Christians, God is praying, I know this person has yet to submit to your will, Father. But would you reveal your love to them, whether it be through your word, whether it's through the fellowship of your people, but would you give them the courage, Father, to surrender their life to you. Jesus is praying for you by name. The question is, are you hearing that truth this morning? Are you ready to begin a new life in Jesus Christ? Be an answer to Jesus' prayer to God the Father. Jesus is praying for you. Praying that you might accept his salvation that you might surrender your will to him. Won't you answer his call? Won't you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior? Now that answer comes by acknowledging your need for Jesus as your Savior. Acknowledging that it's sin that has separated you from God the Father. But the wonderful thing that you've come to realize is that because of Jesus, you can be forgiven. Then it acknowledges your willingness to be obedient to his commands. I mentioned earlier what Jesus had said. When we believe and when we're baptized, we are saved. Maybe there's someone here this morning that needs to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. The Apostle Peter on that day of Pentecost preached to the thousands and he said in response to them, okay, we understand what we've done to Jesus. What do we do in response? And Peter said, you repent, every one of you. You acknowledge the sin in your life and you be baptized for the forgiveness of those sins. And you'll receive not only the forgiveness of those sins, but you'll receive God's gift of his Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, you read it for yourself, folks. And that's what we offer you this morning. 
an opportunity to surrender your life fully to Jesus Christ. We're going to offer an invitation time, and we call it an invitation time because we are inviting you to surrender your life to Jesus. I'm going to make my way down in front in just a moment, and my hope is that as our praise team leads us in this next song, that if you see the need to make Jesus the Lord of your life today, and I hope you see that need, if you see the need to make Jesus the Lord of your life today, then you'll do so by surrendering your life and your will to him. Now, Jesus said if we confess him before men, he'll confess us before our Father in heaven. And so we ask you to make that confession of faith, your belief that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and state your desire to make him as Lord, your Lord and your Savior. And then you follow that up by being obedient to Jesus' command to be baptized. Everything's prepared for you to do that. In fact, the last five Sundays in a row, six Sundays, we've had people respond. Throughout the week, we've had people respond to be obedient to Jesus' command, and we give you that opportunity. But it begins by you first realizing what Jesus offers. Let's get